the question tonight, why were the White House and Pentagon brass confused about the location of this giant aircraft carrier, the USS Carl Vincent, last week, saying it was heading toward Korea as a show of force? President Trump last Wednesday. We are sending an armada, very powerful. And the Secretary of Defense. She's just on her way up there because that's where we thought it was most prudent to have her at this time. In fact, the aircraft carrier was heading in the opposite direction toward Australia for military exercises. A confusing message during the tense showdown with North Korea. It comes across to your potential adversaries as a lack of determination, a lack of will, a lack of certainty about the signal you want to send. Administration officials say confusing guidance from the Pentagon as the ship tonight is heading to Korea. And now a reset in tone from Vice President Pence in Japan. Only yesterday warning North Korea to look at those missile strikes in Syria and the mother of all bombs against ISIS and not test U.S. resolve. Today, Pence emphasizing diplomacy. With diplomatic and economic pressure, we have a chance, we have a chance to achieve our objective of a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. Late today, the president also dialing down his rhetoric about Kim Jong-un with WTMJ, NBC in Milwaukee. Hopefully he wants peace and we want peace and that's going to be the end determination, but we're going to have to see what happens. Likely a reaction to appeals from China, Japan and South Korea, all eager for a diplomatic solution, nervous about all the talk of war with their nuclear neighbor. The Nimitz-class carriers have participated in nearly every crisis and conflict the United States has been involved in over the past 42 years. Nimitz was involved in the failed attempt to rescue U.S. Embassy personnel from Tehran in 1980, and a year later, two F-14s from Nimitz shot down two Su-22 fitters of the Libyan Air Force during the Gulf of Sidra incident in 1981. During the Cold War, Nimitz-class carriers conducted numerous exercises with regional allies, such as NATO and Japan, designed to counter the Soviet Union in wartime. The most successful U.S. Navy carriers of the post-war era all belong to a class named in honor of World War II's most successful admiral, Chester W. Nimitz. The class's lead ship, commissioned in 1975, bears the fleet admiral's name. The Nimitz-class aircraft carriers were, at the time, the largest warships ever constructed. Although superseded by the new Ford class, the 10 Nimitz carriers will continue to form the bulk of the Navy's carrier force for the next 20 to 30 years. Many project a half a century or more. The story of the Nimitz carriers goes back to the mid-1960s. The U.S. Navy was in the process of spreading nuclear propulsion across the fleet, from submarines to cruisers, and had just commissioned the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, Enterprise, in 1961. As older carriers were retired, the Navy had to decide whether to switch over to nuclear power for future ships. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara was ultimately convinced to proceed with nuclear power on the grounds that nuclear carriers had lower operating costs over their service lifetime. He ordered the construction of three nuclear-powered carriers. The result was the Nimitz class. Its first ship was laid down on June 22, 1968. The ship built on the Navy's prior experience with both conventionally powered supercarriers and the Enterprise. The Nimitz retained the layout of previous carriers, with an angled flight deck, island superstructure and four steam-powered catapults that could launch four planes a minute.
At 1,092 feet she was just 24 feet longer than the older Kitty Hawk, but nearly 19,000 tons heavier. More than 5,000 personnel are assigned to Nimitz carriers at sea, with 3,000 manning the ship and another 2,000 in the air wing and other positions. Lower operating costs were not the only benefits of nuclear power. Although nuclear-powered carriers have a maximum official speed of 30 plus knots, their true speed is suspected to be considerably faster. Nimitz and her sister ships can accelerate and decelerate more quickly than a conventional ship, and can cruise indefinitely. Like Enterprise, it is nuclear-powered, but it also streamlined the number of reactors from 8 to 2. Its two Westinghouse A4W reactors can collectively generate 190 megawatts of power, enough to power 47,500 American homes. Finally, nuclear propulsion reduces a carrier battle group's need for fuel. Of course, the real strength of a carrier is in its air wing. The carrier air wings of the Cold War were larger than today's. During the 1980s, a typical carrier air wing consisted of two squadrons of 12 F-14 Tomcat Air Superiority Fighters, two squadrons of 12 F-A-18 Hornet Multi-Role Fighters, one squadron of 10 A-6 Intruder Attack Bombers, one squadron of 4-6 E-2 Hawkeye Airborne Early Warning and Control Planes, 10 S. 3A Viking anti-submarine planes, one squadron of 4A-6B Prowler electronic warfare planes and a squadron of 6SH-3 anti-submarine helicopters. With slight variations per carrier and per cruise, the average Nimitz-class carrier of the Cold War carried between 85 and 90 aircraft. Today the carrier air wing looks quite different. The venerable F-14 Tomcat aged out and was replaced by the FA-18EF Super Hornet. The A-6 intruder was retired without a replacement when the A-12 Avenger carrier stealth bomber was cancelled in 1991. The S-3A Viking was retired in the 2000s and the AR-6B Prowler was replaced by the AR-18G Growler electronic attack aircraft. This resulted in a smaller carrier air wing of approximately 60 planes without dedicated fleet air defense, long-range strike and anti-submarine warfare platforms. The Nimitz-class carriers have participated in nearly every crisis and conflict the United States has been involved in over the past 42 years. Nimitz was involved in the failed attempt to rescue U.S. Embassy personnel from Tehran in 1980, and a year later, two F-14s from Nimitz shot down two Su-22 fitters of the Libyan Air Force during the Gulf of Sidra incident in 1981. During the Cold War, Nimitz-class carriers conducted numerous exercises with regional allies, such as NATO and Japan, designed to counter the Soviet Union in wartime. During Operation Desert Storm, the Nimitz-class carrier Theodore Roosevelt participated in air operations against Iraq. In 1999, Theodore Roosevelt again participated in the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. After 9-11, Carl Vinson and Theodore Roosevelt participated in the first airstrikes against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Since then, virtually all Nimitz-class carriers supported air operations over Afghanistan and both the invasion and subsequent occupation of Iraq. Over a 30-year period 10 Nimitz carriers were built. The last, George Bush, incorporated the latest technology, including a bulbous boat to improve hull efficiency, a new, smaller, modernized island design, upgraded aircraft launch and recovery equipment, and improved aviation fuel storage and handling. The Nimitz-class carriers are a monumental achievement, an enormous, 
highly complex and yet highly successful ship design. The ships will carry on the Nimitz name through the 2050s, with the entire class serving a whopping 80 consecutive years. That sort of performance, and longevity, is only possible with a highly professional, competent Navy and shipbuilding team.